Testing, testing, right now. You can you hear me, brother? Could you hear me, brother? Can you hear me, brother? Uh, yes, brother, I hear you. Loud and clear. When five o'clock, thank eight you. O'clock, uh, just pray, okay, brother, pray. and then we'll just proceed. Okay, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother.
Does the real letter stand for a prayer? Our uh, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Father, that you've allowed us to be able to gather before you this evening to listen to your holy words, your words that would guide us and keep us on the right path so that we may be able to attain that eternal life that you promised unto your children. We pray, our Father, that you would continue to keep your loving arms around your children, that you would continue to guide us and keep us close to you. So, Father, no matter what will happen in this life, if we stumble and fall, we will be able to get back up and continue on our journey because you are there guiding your children. We pray, Father, that you would please bless all of the households of your children. Those, our Father, that may be sick this evening, we ask that you would heal them from their ailments so that they may be able to continue to fulfill their duties and serve in thy most holy name. Those of our brethren, our Father, that are suffering persecution, those that are being hunted down, Father, we ask that you would please continue to guide them, continue to show them the way. Those, our Father, that are in jail, that you would continue to comfort them in their lives so that they will not forget to call upon the most holy name. Bless our children in their everyday lives. Continue to guide them and bless them. Keep them away from the many evils of life, the many temptations that surrounds your servants in this life. We pray, our Father, that you would keep us all on the righteous path so that we may be able to be with you and your son in your kingdom from the day of judgment. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we are so thankful that you was obedient to the Father, that you died on the cross that we might have a right to everlasting life. And we ask you, Lord, to please continue to take our prayers to the Father, asking the Father to hear our prayers and forgive our sins so that we can continue to serve you and our Father until the end of our lives. Our Father, we return to you in prayer, asking that you would please be with our brother that will teach your words this evening. Guide him with your Holy Spirit that he may be able to teach your words with clarity so that all of your servants that are listening will be benefited in our services on today. We truly believe, Father, that you will be with us throughout our Bible study, that you will guide and bless your children because we ask everything in the name of thy son, Jesus. Amen. Beloved, um, Beloved um, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. Um, um, we will continue why continue we are not one, one with EBM and his administration. This is uh, the second part of the lesson that we are to study of the time when I preached around two, two weeks ago. So, so what is it that makes us firm in our stand that we are not to unite with such people? What is our basis? Well, our basis are the teachings of God. We read in the lessons, the lesson that passed by when we were taught that if people will entice us to do things that are evil, then we should not go that way. So no matter who that person is, 
even if he is considered as the most important person in the world by others, we have to also understand that what they apply for the brethren to follow should be based upon the teachings of our God. So, why is it that we can't be one with people even though that they may be considered important to everyone else or to anyone else? What about if what they are doing is no longer in accordance to what the Bible teaches? Then what would happen to us? Let us start our studies in Isaiah 59, 2 to 15. This is recorded. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. We must remember in this passage that the reason why that we are separated from our God is because of the iniquities or sins that we have committed. And we know that if this continues in as people that may continue to say that they have God, but yet they still have iniquities in their life or live in a lifestyle of sin, then God will really not reply or listen to their prayers. It's just a waste of time. What are these sins that may prevent an individual in being heard? by our Lord Almighty God. That is the reason why that we cannot really unite ourselves with such people who may be practicing such. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch viper eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies. And from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. The way of peace they have not known. And there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Therefore, justice is far from us. Nor does righteousness overtakes us. We look for light, but there is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are, we are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. Or our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressions and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. So truth fails and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He According to what we have just read, what is one reason why that we cannot unite with other people, thou they may be important to other people, thou they may be loved by other people, 
even if a person is very important, but if he and his administration is not really living up to what the Bible teaches, if for instance, crooked paths are made and also darkness prevail, injustice, bloodshed, like blind groping in the dark, oppression and revolve, words of falsehood, if this is clearly seen among those whom you will unite with, then what makes it of you? It makes you as you were of them. So of course, we don't want to be amongst those who will take part of any kind of form of iniquity. Why? Because if we will unite in doing the sins or iniquity, then even if we call to our God, even if we pray to him, he will not listen because of the sins and iniquities that we have committed. Now, to whom most of all is this being presented that should make me or must consider that they must do a way of reforming their ways so that God will not separate from them. We read 59, uh, 2 to 15. Let's just jump to 59, 18, New Living Translations. Let's read. He will repay his enemies for their evil deeds. His fury will fall on his foes. He will pay them back even to the ends of the earth. Take note of the passage, beloved brethren, it speaks of his enemies. His enemies that he's speaking about are those who do evil deeds. Where will they, where will they come from? From the time of the ends of the earth. How about in other translation, trace, translation? Let's read the message translation. Let's read. He'll make everyone pay for what they've done. Fury for his foes. Just deserts for his enemies. Even the far off islands will get paid off in full. So there are islands here that are from far off. The one passage we read a while ago. Ends of the earth. God will repay his enemies. Of course, we must not mock God for uh, we can never fool God. Beloved brethren, whatever you plant is what you reap according to Galatians 6, 7. So if you plant iniquity, if you plant crooked paths, if you plant bloodshed, if you plant oppression, if you plant falsehood in everything you do, brothers and sisters, God will repay, repay such people that will come from the time of the ends of the earth or the far off islands will be paid off in full. Another translation, let's read here this time in the Good news translation. He will punish his enemies according to what they have done, even those who live in distant lands. We know distant lands. We know that there's also the distant east that we take in Isaiah 43, 5 of the good news translation as well. But this can be applicable to those people who continue to live in iniquity or in sin. Let's read another translation. New century Version. The Lord will pay back his enemies for what they have done. He will show his anger to those who were against him. He will punish the people in faraway places as they deserve. We know that there is a far off that we all study all the time. Beloved brethren, this is the far east, the islands of the sea in the from the ends of the earth. So doesn't this give uh, a warning, especially to those who may consider themselves as God's people. If they are falling into the kind of sins that were mentioned a while ago, then we should reform our ways because if not, God will pay them back and they will be punished in return because we know that God's anger is upon those who live in the lifestyle of sin. Now, what makes us all the more firm about these passages concerning about that we, especially those whom God should have entrusted this mission so that we would be able to propagate all the more the glory that should be given to our God. We have this in Isaiah 59, 19. Let's read. 
so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. So we know that there is an enemy. And if the enemy is coming from within, beloved brothers and sisters, we are in danger. Why? Because we know that God himself will lift up a standard against him. So we should understand, brethren, this Isaiah 59, 19, we know that we take this in the biblical teachings and doctrines that were taught to us. But there's a warning that there are enemies that will be coming to strive to destroy us. So we must continue as being among those people of God that should continue to give glory to the Lord Almighty God. It will reach the West. We know the West already is the far West, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and Hawaii, according to the uh, Almanac, beloved brethren. And we know that the rising of the sun there is the East, beloved brethren. Uh, if you read that in the Moffat version, that is the far East or the, uh, um, the far West. Uh, rather, so we understand, brothers and sisters, that God expects these people whom he has entrusted not to fall into falsehood, not to be among those who will revolt or be oppressors, or they shouldn't be amongst those people who would spread out lies within their hearts and other things that were mentioned a while ago. They must not be among those who would establish crooked paths so that they will be like blind people groping in the dark as even though it's as noonday, the Bible teaches us. Why? What was God's expectation in the first place from these people that God has called from the times of the ends of the earth, from a far away country, islands of the sea? in the far east distant places or the philippines isaiah 24 14 to 16 17 through 20 they raise their voices they shout for joy from the west they acclaim the lord's majesty therefore in the east give glory to the lord exalt the name of the lord the god of israel in the islands of the sea from the ends of the earth we hear singing Glory to the righteous one. But I said, I waste away. I waste away. Woe to me. The treacherous betray. Which treachery? The treacherous betray. Let us stop there. There is something that God wanted us to all preserve. Is to give glory to the righteous one. But I said, I waste away. I waste away. Woe to me. The treacherous betray. With treachery, the treacherous betray. There is a, someone or some that will lead the betrayal within this kind of mission that was entrusted to the church in these last days. And what will be the result of all this? Because of some betrayed our Lord Almighty God. Let us continue to read the passage. Terror and pit and snare await you people of the earth whoever flees at the sound of terror will fall into a pit whoever climbs out of the pit will be caught in a snare the floodgates of heavens are open the foundation of the earth shake the earth is broken up the earth is split asunder the earth is violently shaken the earth reels like a drunkard its weighs like a hut in the wind so heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again. According to what we have just read, brothers and sisters, what is the result of this, beloved brothers and sisters, that the earth will reel like a drunkard, its waist like a hut in the wind, so heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion. Why? Because those who are entrusted to give glory and honor to God, some of them or most of them, because they united with such people, they turn away from our God. Instead of obedience to God's teaching, they started to rebel. They started to oppress God's people. And because of this, beloved brethren, the Bible says the earth 
reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy. Why? Because it was already filled with sin. But those who were expected to help so that people will be taken out of sin, they somehow betrayed the Lord Almighty God. What is it that they have done? They have committed tre treachery. What are these treachery that the Bible is indicating? It's Ephesians 3, 4. The prophets are irresponsible and treacherous. The priests defile what is sacred and twist the law of God to their own advantage. What is this treacherous act that was committed by such people within the present administration? They defile what is sacred. They twist the law of God to their own advantage. Remember when they started expelling the families? They were expelling prayer families. They twisted the teachings of God to their own advantage. Could you imagine they didn't fulfill what the messenger have thought in Deuteronomy 24, 16? Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. What did they do? For the sin of the mother, for the sin of the father to them. The whole family commits sins, so they all are expelled. We know they did not go to the due process, even expelling the members of the family of the late executive minister. But we know that all this expulsion could only be said that it is only expulsion from the synagogues, as written in John 16, 1 and 2. But they could never expel us from the church because that was the reason why that we continued to be members of the church of Christ because God set us apart to go on so that we don't have to contribute to the factor that we will revolt against God, that we will be also oppressors, that we will be among those who will be found in crooked paths no more. Should we be found in those matter? Why is it that even if there are so many within the institution knows about the twisted doctrines that they use for their own advantage, beloved brethren, why is it that they did not follow? I mean, why is it that they did not stand up, in other words? But because if they will follow them, what does the Bible have to say if they follow a twisted doctrine? Second Peter 3.16, let's read. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also to the rest of the scriptures. What's going to happen if people will start to unite with such administration? Will they unite with them with a twisted doctrine to their own destruction? But why were they able to convince the brethren when so many of them also know what's really going on. Zephaniah 3, 1 and 8. Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The Lord is righteous in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning, he brings his justice to light. He never fails, but the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their fortress are devastated. I have made their streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off despite everything for which I punish her. But they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nation to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with fire of my jealousy. What is it that you should notice about what God is talking about here? Beloved brothers and sisters, he is so angry 
towards those who oppress the city that the Bible makes mention here, oppressing city. So anyone who practices oppression, anyone who goes against God's teaching some concerning this, God's fury is really kindled. And he will devour the whole earth, including all those who will oppress. And if you unite with people who does oppress, and you will also go with them under God's punishment, you will not be amongst those who will be blessed on that great day, but suffer the anger of God and won't be saved on the day of judgment. So beloved brothers and sisters, who led the oppression or the, who led the people to be oppressed and who were the first ones to be oppressed? Isaiah 1, 8 through 10 and 23. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in the vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, un besieged city Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord. You rulers of Sodom, give ear to the law of our God. You people of Gomorrah, your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Our question is this, who read, who led this way of oppressing God's people, the rulers of the very, uh, of the church of Christ in this last days? We already have already studied this in the past, beloved brethren, that we know that the daughter of Zion was under attack but the rulers of it, those who led them, they were the one who caused oppression. How did they cause, cause oppression? They did not defend the fatherless. They did not hear the cause or the plead of the widow, beloved brothers and sisters. And what is it that we all saw during this time? That they were those who love rewards, follows after rewards. That's why they have so many Guinness Book of Record reward because all that they're after is the reward of these things of this world. And we also understand that they accepted bribes when they participated, when those top ministers of the administration, when they sold the vote of the church. We know during the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, there was one who was a Judas there. He sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Could you imagine that in our time, there are more Judas now? If you ride the Jeep, God knows who does not pay. That's the Jeep, the Philippines. But now I don't think they could ride their Jeep right now, right? But the thing is this. Do you think if you are a person who is considered in betraying our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is a part of the administration that is in our time, how could you unite? Think about it. How could you unite with such people? Right? Why would you unite? For people who oppresses their fellow men, especially their, their loved ones, put people in jail without due process. You know, so many things that they should consider if they are really God's chosen nation as the people that was entrusted the ministry of reconciliation as written in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19, then they should reconcile and fix all this matter. But if they cannot, then truly, they are not able to fulfill the very role of them giving glory to God. But instead, they chose the wrong path, crooked paths, which will separate them. But at the end, will destroy them on the day when our Lord God will send his begotten son. So, what is so wrong if the institution or the most part of the church, because why we say the most part of the church, 
turns like to Sodom and Gomorrah because before it will turn all to Sodom and Gomorrah, God have set aside the very small remnant, the, the few. And that's us. That's why even if they want to try to expel us out, the one that's really expelled is them, not us. Because we are among those whom God set apart so that we won't be like them, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Those people who supported an administration that oppresses people, they are part of Sodom and Gomorrah. What's wrong with that? You might be saying, so what if I'm like Sodom and Gomorrah? Watch Avatar. Is, that, is, is Avatar there? There's a person named Gomorrah in there? Is that? What, what, what movies is that? Gardens of Galaxy? Okay. So what? Why? What's wrong? If you are a part of Sodom and Gomorrah in what the Bible teaches, Jude 1 7, let's read it. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You ready to do that? That's very fiery, brother. Why are you so fire? Because the Bible says eternal fire. Notice that Sodom and Gomorrah here the reason why that they were also thrown or to suffer vengeance of eternal fire is because of fornication. Take note of that, beloved brethren. Now, let me ask you. As a member of the Church of Christ in this last days. We're talking about not the very small remnant, those who say that they are still God's people. Let me ask you this. If you will suffer eternal fire, the vengeance of eternal fire, does that mean you're going to be saved? Think about it. Is it worth uniting with such people that will bring you down towards eternal punishment in the lake of fire? You're probably saying, how did it become uh, this situation, how did it become so worse? To what else the institution of EVM turned into? Let's read in Isaiah 121 and 23. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. 23. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves, every one of his bribes, and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. So what happened to the church under the rule of the present administration now? It became heartlessly, or harlot in other words. Remember the term fornication that was made by Sodom and Gomorrah, which why which is why they will be punished. Is the church also in danger? The so what the one that we're talking about, not us that have been set apart as to continue as a very small remnant. We're talking about those who support and to be one with the most important man in the whole wide world, according to them. Why is it that they are very why is it that they are in danger? Why is it that if one falls in harlotry, he is all the more putting himself in danger? To what is that in the New Testament? Revelations 18, 2 and 10. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt and a hunt for every impure spirit, a hunt for every unclean bird, a hunt for every unclean detestable animal, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery. If you read this in the King, New, King, New King James Version, fornication with her and 
the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries, wanting to escape Babylon judgment. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven. And God has remembered her crimes, give back to her as she has given, pay her back double for what she has done, for, for her a double portion from her own cup, give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself in her heart. She boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. So uh, according to what we have just read, uh, beloved brethren, this is concerning about Babylon. But let's continue to proceed. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her death. Mourning and famine, she will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judge, judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury, see she smokes of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour, your doom has come. So what is it that we should understand when a church starts to involve themselves with the government? How is that? When you take bribe from the government, isn't that political? When you take a special mission of being uh, an envoy, is that an envoy? Isn't that a part of taking part of the government? Beloved brethren, that's fornication, adultery before God's sight. And that's what makes them Babylon as well. And the terrifying thing is this, beloved brethren, they will suffer the punishment because they have been considered also as Babylon. Could you imagine that? That's why you heard in the passage, get out of her, my people. God has, is calling such people who are being terrified with such kind of acts that makes them into Babylon. So, what is the commandment of God if people are turning to be like Babylon from the ends of the earth? Let's read Isaiah 48, 20. Leave Babylon. Flee from Babylon, the Babylonians. Announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant, Jacob. The question is this, beloved brethren, what is God's call? To all those who are in captivity of Babylon, they should flee away from them. If you read this in the King James Version, some might say that these are the Chaldeans that you should flee from, beloved brethren. So why is it that you are saying that this pertains to also the people from the time of our time, that they should get out from this kind of Babylon because Chaldeans are a part of Babylon, that is a part of Babylon. And what makes it different is this, they are the people there that are very intelligent, established and really well off. So the Chaldeans, in, uh, if you really, really study them, they were the ones who convinced King Nebuchadnezzar to oppress God's people. Who are God's people that were oppressed during the time of King Nebuchadnezzar? Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. They were thrown there in a furnace of fire. Could you imagine if you're like a person that likes to oppress people? God is saying, flee from them. If you're saying that's for the Chaldeans, the act of 
oppressing is not an act that God would want you to have or to fulfill in your life. You should flee from any kind of organization or a church that practices oppressions because this is God's call. Even it says there, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Send it out to the ends of the earth. So whether the ends of the earth here is, you may say, is time or a place. What is important is that the act that God would want for his people, if ever they are captivity or in captive uh, or being in Babylon, they, they should flee from them. So the question is this, who are those? Who are the first ones that should really act upon this call of God? So that they will be utilized as people who will make God's people in the proper way of honoring him and turning away from wickedness. Isaiah 52, 10 through 11. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there touch no unclean thing come out from it and be pure you who carry the articles of the lord's house so who are those being mentioned here that should really act upon in leading god's people from the time of the ends of the earth that should live a righteous way of life to come out from touching things that are not clean come out from there those who are involved or who carry the articles of the Lord's house. In the Christian era, the Lord's house, we know in 1 Timothy 3.16, the house there is a church. And those who are involved in leading the church is the administration, the ministers, the district minister, the executive ministers, the officers. They should be the first one to carry out in leading a new way of life. We must stop oppression. We must stop uh, in trying to make excuses of how we dishon dishonor our mother or our father. We should be the first ones to really love our brothers and sisters, especially if they are the your flesh, blood, brothers and sisters. We should renew our lives. We should reconcile. We should change for the betterment to make God's honor and shine and for our God to be glorified. So how is it that we can come out from it and be pure? Like what the Bible is saying, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. Let's read here in 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. How is this possible? that we will not touch anything impure. We must completely renew our ways of life. Is this not what was taught to us? Were we not taught to love one another? Beloved brethren, as I have loved you, Christ says in John 13, 34 to 35, were we not taught to love even our enemies as written in the book of Matthew 5, 42, 43, 44, 46, and 47? All this we know are the teachings and commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have we not been taught by the Lord Jesus Christ to honor our father and mother? Matthew 15, 4. Have we not been taught that we should all be holy because without holiness and peace, we cannot meet with our Lord as written in Hebrew 12, 14. Have we not been taught in 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, the one that called us is holy, therefore you must be holy. And where were we called? Colossians 3, 15, in the one body. Body, which is the body, Colossians 1 18, and he's the head of the body, the church. What is the name of the church? We already know that, Acts 20 28, the church of Christ. 
But if they cannot change under this administration, God has set apart a very small remnant, beloved brethren. They are the ones that you should be in join with right now because they are the ones that help those who are oppressed. They are the ones or are those people who also listen to the plea of the widow. They are the ones who also help the fatherless as mentioned in the Holy Scriptures that we should all do. What furthermore proves, beloved brothers and sisters, if an individual will not get out of Babylon, but continue to do all the wick works of sin, like oppression. You know, Babylon is known for a defiant city. They are the one that oppresses people during their time, like what we have said, like King Nebuchadnezzar was influenced by the Chaldeans to oppress, oppress the people of God, like Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But we know the story. God did not forsake the three Hebrews because they were loyal and faithful to God. So no matter what it takes, brethren, if you have to stand up to what is right, which some of us have done already, let us unite to do what is right and stand on the side of the Lord Almighty God. If not, what will be wrong? If we will still be under the captivity of Babylon, Isaiah 13, 19, I'll read Babylon, the jewels of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. What's going to happen if we are still under the spell or under Babylon? Well, they will be punished like Sodom and Gomorrah. What made them get punished like Sodom and Gomorrah? Let's read it again. Isaiah 1, 8 through 10, 21 and 23. So the daughter of Zion left in the booth in the vineyard as a hut in the garden, cucumbers and as a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Let's continue to read. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God. You people of Gomorrah, continue. So the daughter of Zion is left in the movie. Read that a while. Continue. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. How did it become like Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, when people started to be rebellious and they became uh, companions of thieves, when they continue to accept bribes and follow rewards, when they did not defend the fatherless or the plea of the widow, beloved brethren, that's the time the church, part of it, most of it, because most of them will unite with that administration, they will become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Not only that, they are like also Babylon. If they are like also Babylon, what's wrong? Then they themselves are not going to be assured of salvation because even the luxury that they experienced, like what we mentioned a while ago, isn't it that there are some complaint that some of them are living in a luxurious life, having making the church into a business, having other kinds of form of livelihood. If you're a minister and you're part of the so-called administration, you have all these business. Is that something that you should really be happy about? You're falling into a luxurious life, but that won't save you on the day of judgment. You may gain the whole world, our Lord Jesus Christ says, but if you will not, if you lose your life, you gain nothing. Why? Because you lost the most important thing of all. It's the salvation of your soul. And what further proves that if you go on in uniting with such administration, it will not lead you to salvation. Revelation 13, 16. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So this is a... Uh, something that you should understand. There's a mark given on the right hand or on the foreheads. So it's either of the two. Remember what brother Iranio G. Manalo says, that the church will no longer be totally apostatized. That's why probably only half of this is given to those who will turn away, which is that 
to receive a mark on their right hand. Do you see that thumb mark? I am one with EVM, brothers and sisters. And do you remember when they made you take the R201 files? They put your mark on the left hand, on the right hand also, there on the R201. Isn't that a mark signifying that you belong and you unite yourself with that administration? Brothers and sisters, why is it that we are exposing all of this? Because if you have a mark on the right hand and forehead, what is that on the day of judgment? Revelations 14, 9 through 11. Then a third angel. We already know that a third angel being spoken of there is the late uh, uh, messenger of God in this last days that we have proven already in the past or long time ago. Then a third angel followed him saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receive his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest. They or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So what is so wrong if you have that mark? A mark that will lead you to be burnt forever and ever into the lake of fire. So brothers and sisters, others might be saying, were they not placed there to preach to us or to be ministers to us? Yes. Who really put ministers into the church in the first place? First Timothy 1, 12 through 13. Let's read. I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength for my work. I thank him for considering me worthy and appointing me to serve him. Even though in the past I spoke evil of him and persecuted and insulted him, but God was merciful to me because I did not, I did not yet have faith and so did not know what I was doing. Who was speaking here? Apostle Paul. According to him, how was he placed in the ministry? He was appointed by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we understand that the reason why there are ministers within the church, they were appointed by God. But the question is, as God has appointed the messenger of God, who kept the covenant of God, God says, I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness. The righteousness of God is the gospel, Romans 1, 16 and 17. And the prophecy was Isaiah 41, 9 through 10. The same spirit that Brother Irano G. Manalo possessed. But when a person comes in and no longer follows the covenant that was entrusted to their ancestors, is God able to stop their ministry and those with him? Let's read Malachi. 2, 4 to 13, then you will know that I have given you this command so that my covenant with the priests, the descendants of Levi, will not be broken. In my covenant, I promised them life and well-being. And this is what I gave them so that they might respect me. In those days, they respect, they did respect and fear me. Let's stop there. There was a time, right? That even in our time, during the time of Brother Felix Manalo and Brother Irania G. Manalo, the words of God were truly respected. And God said that they respected me. Let's continue. Then you will know that I have given you this command so that my covenant with the priests, the descendants of Levi, will not be broken. In my covenant, I promised them life and well-being. And this is what I gave them so that they might respect me. In those days, they did respect and fear me. They taught what was right. Remember that. During the time of the messenger, during the time of Brother Raja G. Manolo, they taught what was right. They did not twist the doctrines. They did not invent doctrines and then start twisting them for their own advantage. Not what was wrong. See, they did not teach things that was wrong. They live in harmony with me. They not only did what was right themselves, but they also help many others to stop doing evil. So the purpose why God sent these true messengers is for people to stop doing evil, not to be placed there and to promote evil, to promote hatred, to promote oppression, to promote 
things that are against God's teachings. That is not the purpose of God. It is the duty of the priest to teach the true knowledge of God. People should go to them to learn my will because they are the messengers of the Lord Almighty. But now, but now you priests have turned away from the right path. So this is a time that the there are those other descendants or the other preachers. They turn from the right path. Your teachings had led many to do wrong. You have broken the covenant I made with you. You see, God is speaking now, especially to all these ministers in the institution. You have broken the covenant I made with you, God is saying. So I turn. So I, in turn, will make the people of Israel despise you because you do not obey my will. And when you teach my people, you do not treat everyone alike. Favoritism, right? Or those because they are friends with their um, co-ministers or near the administrator. They treat them more kindly than the others or even in expelling they can see that there are those who have done wrong but because one brother or sister had this question is it true that the church really don't owe the philippine arena oh is it true that uh there's uh so many things that People are being just expelled, even their whole family, when they start questioning, they get expelled themselves without a clear explanation of why they are expelled, because they are not treating everyone alike. They have favoritism. Is there another part of it? Don't we all, don't we all have the same father? Then the same God created us all. Then why do we break our promises to one another? And why do we despise the covenant that God made with our ancestors? That is the question. Why do we despise the covenant made with Brother Felix Manalo and those who followed after them? How do you despise it when we have no longer followed the teachings and commandments taught to us? The teachings about brotherhood, the teachings about loving one another, the teaching of forgiving one another, the teachings of not making the church participate in any kind of political affair. All this has been taught during the time of the messenger, during the time of the messenger, during the time of Brother Iranya Jimanalo. The church owes nothing. And it should be that way. It was one of the preaching of Brother Iranya Jimanalo. If we own only at least one said, isang kusing, maghahiwahi walay na tayo. What does that mean? We should just separate from one another. Now let's continue. The people of Judah have broken their promise to God and done a horrible thing in Jerusalem and all over the country. They have defiled the temple which the Lord loves. Men have married women who worship foreign gods. May, so what is it that God, the Bible is going to say about these preachers who broke the covenant? May the Lord remove from the community of Israel those who did this and never again let them participate in the offerings our nations bring to the Lord Almighty. They should not even preach anymore. They should no longer preach because they can't even preach right now because they're also in lockdown. The one that's preaching actually is the head of the family when they're reading that piece of paper, right? You see what you've done to those who you have oppressed? God has done this to you all. God made you feel how we could not enter the houses of worship. Now you feel that. God made you feel the way that we could not attend the, uh, the worship services within the institution. But you yourself are feeling that. You feel the agony and pain. What you plant is what you reap, beloved brethren, beloved ministers inside the institution this is another thing you do the bible says you drown the lord's altar with tears weeping and wailing because he no longer accept the offerings you bring 
him. So imagine, even if they will go back to the houses of worship and drown the pulpit with tears, God will not listen to them anymore. Why? Because they were the first ones that did not listen to the Lord Almighty God. So what do you think is God saying to them? Remove from the community of Israel those who did this and never again let them participate in the offering of our nations bring to the Lord. How does God remove such people when they're still inside? You're probably saying and preaching if ever they will preach. 69, 23, 27, and then 28. Let their eyes be darkened. Why? Because they're, they make crooked paths and so that they're groping in daylight as uh, they were blind. They cannot see where they're going. They stumble, right? Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into the righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So how would they be removed when they're still within the institution? Well, they have been removed already when, when God has set apart a very small remnant. They have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Not only that, they became like Babylon. Beloved brethren, see how evil that is and how it will hurt at the end of time. They will not be saved because they are amongst those who support an administration that does not follow God's words. They have broken the covenant of God. And so why is it that you don't uh, submit when it is a teaching of God, they say. Let's read. The teaching, Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us for we are confident that we have good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the Lord, may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, through whom be Glory forever and ever. Amen. So according to what we have just read, beloved brethren, are we against that teaching to submit ourselves to uh, those who lead us? No. We are only against that when they will not submit to the leader of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, to do the things that are right and proper if they will only correct their acts and ways and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, why not? We should submit. But as long as they are not changing and obeying the teachings and the commandments of our God and the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ, we could not submit because they're not living honorably. And according to the Bible, beloved brethren, why is it worth following Christ more than just following man? Here on earth. Let's read in John 10, 27, 28. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. According to what we have just read. Why is it but worth following the Lord Jesus Christ? Why is it that if one stops following Christ. Thou, you are a leader, a minister, an executive minister. But if you stop following Christ, we cannot follow you because you will mislead us. Because the one that will follow you will be misled. But the one that will follow Christ, if you follow Christ, it is but right for us to follow you. Because what you are following is the teachings and the commandments of Christ. And if we follow Christ, then we will have eternal life. You could not give us eternal life, brother even if you are important to many people. But our Lord Jesus Christ can. 
but we could all gain eternal life. Beloved brethren, beloved ministers, if we will follow the Lord Jesus Christ, if we will set aside all our pride and never mind our dignity, like our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was crucified on the cross, he did not think of himself. He did not say, why should I die for these people? When in fact, I did not sin. He did not say that. He even prayed for the sinners and said, I pray for them because please forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. That's the kind of spirit that should reign in all of us ministers from the administration all the way to the regular members. Beloved brethren, that way we will follow Christ come with me. And if by chance we followed Christ, and despite of that, we have been rejected, we have been oppressed, we have been chased, we have been hurt in many ways, or we have been cast out from the institution. Beloved brethren, who is there that can help us? Psalms 147. Praise to God. For his word and providence. Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant. And praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the broken hearted. And binds up their wounds. The Lord takes pleasure. In those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. According to what we have read, who will be there to bind up those who were hurt or those who were cast away, who will be there to look for us? God Himself. God will have mercy upon those people who fear him, not those who fear man. Because the fear of man is here only on earth and will not save them. But the fear that we should have is fear towards our God. And the Lord takes pleasures in those who fear him, in those who hope in his service. Others are asking us, even that, that we are only few ministers and workers that are standing for what is true. Why do you sacrifice even everything for this mission for leading a new way of life and for the church to reform why are you trying to be some uh, special person out there they might say are you trying to, to just make yourself different and to uh, find people to look at you in a different way and support you no why is it that we do so Let's read Jude 120 to 23. Let's read. But you, dear friends, by building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Why is it that we are willing to sacrifice everything for this mission? Is to have mercy, show compassion towards our fellow ministers, the administration and the administrator, and also all of our brothers and sisters within the institution. So that they will all be enlightened. And so that they also will have that mercy of eternal life. And they will not be amongst those who will be punished. They will be among those who will be saved. That's the reason why we take that extra effort. Is we want all to be saved. It's just that what God wants. That all come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. First Timothy 
two, three, and four. Is this not what our Lord Jesus Christ would want? That he gives his life for the church because he wants it to be saved, Ephesians 5.25 and 5.23. So what we learn from the Lord Jesus Christ, what we learn through the messenger and the administration of Brother Iranya Giovanello and the teachings of our God is to love the church. That's why we're willing to sacrifice even our lives for the sake of the church, for the sake of our brethren, for the sake of the ministers, for the sake of what is going on. Why? Because we don't want them to perish. We don't want them among those who will be left behind on the day of judgment. We would want that at the end we'll be together to have our reward, our salvation on the day of judgment. Even after this, if others may hear it within the institution, even if you will persecute us and hate us, it is not going to stop us. Because all that we're after is for your salvation. All that we're after is for the glory of our God. So we hope and desire that someday everything will be straightened out. If they would want to straighten things out, they should start with their own family from the leadership from the top and start fetching for their brothers and sisters and to remove Brother Angel and all the rest of them in jail. And they should also already strive to reach out to forgive and to prepare and to renew so that all of us will be saved on that great day. None of us wants to be left behind. On the day of judgment, all of us wants to be saved. So brothers and sisters, if that is what we all desire for, then we are willing to sacrifice our ego. We're willing to sacrifice our pride. We're willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of the mission of our God, so that man, who is need of salvation will be given salvation and eternal life. Let that be that we will be the hindrance of God's mission, but will be used as an instrument in reaching out to the many people who are still walking in darkness. This is our lesson. Let us stand and let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again, dear Lord, for helping us to study your teachings and commandments. Oh, Father in heaven, we know that we have gone this far because it was you who have called us to this mission, dear Father. Oh, Father in heaven, we beg of you to please help us carry on because we know that this route that we took is a lonely route filled with other agony and pains. But, oh, Lord, even though that we have to take that route, but because it is the route that you chose for us, even if we did not want to go that way, but we still went that way because it is your will. The same thing with our Lord Jesus Christ. He did not want to die. He even spoke to you and asked if it is possible for this cup of suffering to pass, but yet he still followed your will. That only shows that we are human. That only shows that we have all our limitations. Oh, Father in heaven, we ask of you, grant us strength, give us courage when we feel that we are down, when we feel that we are lonely, when we feel that we are depressed and oppressed. Oh, Father in heaven, always send, us, send forth your spirit, because that gives us the inspiration to go on in fighting for our faith. May many other of our brethren within the institution be enlightened. May they stand for what is right, so that they too will be members of the true church and prepare themselves for the salvation that is drawing near. Father in heaven, we do believe you have heard our prayers. And we may please bless those who may be sick this very moment. May you cure them from any kinds of ailments so that nothing will hinder us in serving thy most holy name. Dear Lord Jesus, if it is not too much to ask, we pray to you this very moment. We pray for the administration inside the institution, oh Father. Please bless Brother Eduardo Manalo and all the ministers. May they be able to be enlightened, to really show and give respect to your words. 
may they follow you. May they follow our Father. May they feel that there is still hope, that they will fix everything up. So if it is still possible, dear, dear Lord, they can be able to be used as instruments in righteousness, in giving glory and praise to your holy name. Father in heaven, we do believe you have heard our prayers for everything we do ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved uh, brothers and sisters, we thank you once again for joining us in our Bible studies. Uh, we are finished and bye-bye, Paul.